So what about all this art as religion business? Is it, as the late great Freddie Mercury might say, just radio caca? The reality hits the fan as Dougie Padilla joins me in studio to talk all things art, life, and soul, while confronting the potential for a fairy tale approach to the arts, and spirituality for that matter. Won't you join us in four, three, two, Hello, art enthusiasts and art lovers. Welcome to episode three of Art Wonderful, the art podcast where art is a religion. I'm your host, Nicholas Harper. I'm broadcasting from my art studio deep within the Rogue Buddha Gallery. That's in the heart of the Northeast Arts District in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank you for joining me as we explore everything the arts have to offer. It's the mission of this podcast to spread the gospel of the arts their essential value to our everyday lives, and to offer a deep dive exploration into this most mysterious of subjects. You can learn more about myself, the Rogue Buddha Gallery, this podcast, and those we have on the show by visiting us online at roguebuddha.com. Click podcast from the menu. And be sure to listen to the end of this and every episode, as I'll be sharing my pick of what art event you simply can't miss this weekend, should you find yourself in our neck of the woods here in the Twin Cities. This is brought to you by our, our amazing partner, we art enthusiasts simply can't live without, MPLSArt.com. For episode three, I was delighted to have in studio with me an artist that transcends the title artist. Dougie Padilla has been called an art legend, a visionary, and guru. Poet, painter, spirit dancer, Padilla encapsulates all that it is to be an artist. At the heart of his work exists a soul that has traversed worlds and lived many lives, from artist to businessman to communal farmer to humble meditative disciple in India to a father and a husband. You can find more about him online at DougiePadilla.com. On Instagram at Dougie Land and Facebook at Dougie Padilla. As this art podcast thing is a new venture for me, I thought it would be amazing to have him on right away as the first artist interview. He's the perfect guest for a number of reasons. First, we're still coming off of what I'm sure is the most important exhibit of his career, which just so happened to take place here at the Rogue Buddha Gallery this past September. Secondly, when I first opened the gallery 20 years ago, he was right here, introducing himself, offering guidance and insights into the art world, and asking what my intentions were with this newfangled gallery. And finally, he encapsulates a lot of what this show is all about, in that he covers a lot of ground in the art world, not only as an artist, but a curator, a spokesperson, and advocate and community leader. In fact, one of the boards I sit on, the Northeast Arts District, well, he had something to do with creating that. Oh, and a little art fair in Minneapolis called Art World. Over the years as I've grown in my role as an artist and gallery owner, I've kept an eye on what Dougie was up to and taken his lead where my involvement in the community at large is concerned. All of that said, I was extremely thankful that Dougie Padilla agreed to be on this newfangled art podcast. Based on prior conversations he and I have had and artist talks he's given, it seemed that his life and art dealt pretty heavily with the spirit world, which told me that he tends to believe that there's something more, something beyond what we can experience with our five senses, and I wanted to dig deep into that. But first I asked if he could tell us a little bit about himself and how he got involved in the arts as an artist and as an ambassador of the arts. Ladies and gentlemen, Dougie Padilla. Well, first of all, I'm going to ignore that. And, uh, <laughs> and so it I, starts. I mean, I'll get to that in a second. But the first thing I want to mention is the word is art as religion. Yeah. You know, the Chinese say whatever has a front has a back. The bigger the front, the bigger the back. So that statement has an upside, but it also has a downside. Because there is, mm -hmm. there's a real negative out there uh, in the way that some people approach the art world and the buying and selling of art, the gallery scene, the museum scene, as a pseudo religion, in 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 the more superficial sense of the word, because there's a lot of religion in the world that is just about one inch deep. 
Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And and about this, that, and the other. So I think I think you need to uh, be specific. And um, I'm more interested in the just as I'm more interested in spirituality than religion, as many people are. Um, I'm more interested in not the spiritual in art because that's also uh, everything is capable of a wrong turn. But uh, and spirituality in art can can uh, be both deep and superficial. Mm-hmm. It isn't intrinsically deep. Sure. Um, but um, but but somehow in this whole thing, I think it'll be nice to delve into um, sort of a, how can we move archetypally deeper into our own lives via uh, not just visual art but the arts and creativity. Mm-hmm. Now, what was the question you asked about how I got into all this? <laughs> yeah, what brought you into the arts? What was your like entry? Well, entry that's, point? A, that's a question that's you know my entry was that uh, in grade school my mother was a piano teacher and uh, I grew up in a Lutheran in the suburbs and uh, the Lutheran church that I grew up in my mom was part of and I had to go to choir classes. And so by, and sing in the choir, and by the time I was 11, I could sight, read, and sing Bach cantatas. Yeah. And uh, I was part of a choir that was making records of Bach cantatas. That's pretty heavy-duty training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and by junior high, the, I hated it. I just hated it. Because, you know, what I wanted to be doing is playing baseball 24-7. Yeah. So I could be Willie Mays. Um but in retrospect, in the rearview mirror, I discovered that the choir master was my first true spiritual teacher, and that uh, you know to have to be able to string the hello, be able to sing the hallelujah chorus by memory, you know, by the time you're 15, is a kind of a phenomenal training to have gone through. Yeah. But from there, that I'll, I'll try to jump to where the you know I always. I, I was always making music, although I didn't do very well. I wasn't that good, you know, piano, French horn, flute, guitar, singing. Um, and uh, somewhere in high school, I started writing. So by college, I was a published poet. But then, you know, I flunked out of college and hit the road and fought against the war in Vietnam and lived in Haight-Ashbury and took psychedelics. Yeah. So, you know, once you're out there doing that, you're starting, you know, taking psychedelics for me was a very spiritual thing. Um, and, you know, I had a psychotic break at 19, went nuts, um, then got into psychedelics. I had a heart failure at 20. And after that, I ended up in one of the first ashrams in North America in Quebec, the Shivananda Yoga Ashram, where I became a certified yoga instructor in 1969. Mm-hmm. And was I, that power I, yoga core? Oh, no, <laughs> you know none of that stuff. Was, none of that stuff was around in those days. And and yeah. I'm 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 uh, let's just say I'm highly skeptical because I was taught within a lineage mm-hmm. um, where my I know who my teachers' teachers were mm-hmm. swamis from India. Swami Vishnu Devananda, Swami Venkatesananda, Swami Chidananda, Swami Satchidananda. And I just felt, um, you know, Hatha Yoga, the postures, was just a, just a, you know, a ninth of it. It was a nine, ninefold path, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I find it challenging. So anyway, today that, so I went from there, wandered around the country a lot, lived in ashrams, lived in communes spiritual communities, help start co-ops, you know, was a single dad. Then I went to India in 78 to live with Rajneesh, which is a whole other story. Uh, I lived in his ashram out there. And then I came back, spent time studying with a Zen master, Japanese Zen master here in Minneapolis. Um, was a single dad for eight years. Um, helped Robert Bly stop, start the men's movement. Uh, men's mythopoetic movement. Um, yeah. Somewhere in there, the visual art drawing percolated. Mm-hmm. 
And it was at one of the Bly retreats 30 years ago or more, 40 years ago, whatever, 40 years ago, that I just kind of, the, the, I realized I was a visual person. I always thought music was how I faced the world, but it turned out I was visual. What were these retreats? Okay, so uh, Bly in the 70s started working with some amazing women and some amazing other teachers, and there was something called the... Uh, Great Mother Conference that happened, where it was a rebirth of interest in the, you know, the mythopoetic world of the Great Mother, and out of that it became obvious that men were kind of lost. Mm -hmm. So uh, he started. He did a retreat in California, and then because he's from Minnesota, he was back here lecturing, and uh, he said he wanted to do a retreat here for men, and I said I'd organize it. So I did that for a few years, and I probably went to uh, 15, 20 years of retreats with him. Wow. And mythopoetic in the sense that there is there are whole levels of, you know, life, existence, living, that are largely unknown and ignored in, in uh, modern, modern Western life. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to reaccess those. And some of those are, you know... I don't know how the gender world would talk about them today, but it was important for us to do this uh, in an all-male setting, just as the women had gone off in the 70s and really walked through their own doorway, which I think was you know, extremely important, and I actually th think it is still mm -hmm. extremely important. So we, we, we drummed, we danced, we, we learned fairy tales, we told myths, and probably you know poetry, art, um, woods, nature... Uh, but probably the most important thing Bly did was not only was he a, a great teacher and mentor to me and to you know, literally thousands of other people, but he brought in other teachers that were extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I got to uh, spend a bunch of time with the great uh, Jungian archetypal psychologist James Hillman. Okay. I got to spend time with the African elder uh, Melodoma Somme. I got to spend time with the Mayan medicine man, shaman, uh, Martin Prechtel. Okay. Um, there was just this list. The tracker, stalker, John Stokes, just this list of amazing people. I can tell stories forever hanging out with those folks because those that was brilliant stuff. Yeah. And somewhere along the way, by the in the 80s, I was being a single dad and, uh, but I was, whenever I wasn't being a single dad, I was down at the bars hanging out with, in the art world. Yeah. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was, you know, one of the important things if you're a self-taught artist is to see, you know, a thousand shows, mm -hmm. uh, to look at a thousand books, to talk to artists day and night. Yeah. And I was doing that in the eighties while I was learning to draw. And by somewhere in the early nineties, uh, I had enough confidence to just kind of pop out and, and start going public. Yeah. And started, um, because I'm a lifelong activist and organizer, I just started organizing my own shows. You know? Yeah. Was that at the uh, uh, the Tire? It was at the S&M Tire building, I think, yeah. that I started that stuff. I started with something called Salon Surrealismo, where I invited artists over and, you know, I, I facilitated discussions of yeah. various things. A nice side story is I have a crazy friend who uh, used to drive to Salon Sartissimo with a, um, a lampshade on his head <laughs> in, in honor of the Surrealists. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, funny. And then, you know, I started Art Jones Gallery. I started a pop-up gallery in the 90s. Yeah. Which was, it wasn't a thing then. Nobody ever called it a pop-up gallery. I just started showing my work and other people's work. And uh, so Art Jones Gallery started back then, and I then I started Salon Artissimo, where I, 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 you know, I did all sorts of performances and discussions and things, and invited people over to do this, that, and the other. Yeah. And um, but anyway, blah blah blah, and uh, you know, I worked my way up spiritually through, you know, I'm initiated in three traditions. Uh, uh, Shivananda, Yogananda, and uh, Rajneesh. And I came close to taking initiation in the Zen Buddhist tradition with Kadigiri Roshi, but 
Yeah. Roshi sent me to India instead. Yeah. Can I ask what an initiation looks like or entails? It's very different, and there's different senses of the word initiation. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm talking about formal initiations uh, in the Hindu traditions or the uh, Japanese Buddhist traditions, Mm -hmm. but you also can be initiated by the universe. You have to know what's going on, but you might wake up, uh, this has happened to me, and I can wake up from a dream. It's happened just a few times in my life where I wake up from a dream and I was taken to a different place by spiritual teachers and, you know, okay, now you start the next chunk of your life. Yeah, yeah. But with the formal thing, the first real initiation in the Hindu tradition that I had was with Swami, with Swami Venkatesananda at the Shivananda Ashram in Quebec. And I had to bring some fruit and a mm-hmm. few flowers. And we sat on the floor. He was a monk, an Indian monk. And uh, he gave me a mantra. And he taught me how to uh, say and chant my mantra. Yeah. And 51 years later, I still do it every day. Yeah. But initiation occurs in, in many different ways from different people. Yeah. So you're not jumping in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. As Prince would want us to do in purple. Well, way. no, I mean they, that can be part of. I mean, ritual <laughs> is important. Yeah. And and ritual, I do ritual all the time. I did ritual here at your show that you didn't know about. Oh. oh. I never, I never open a show or have a poetry performance that I'm doing or anything I do without blessing the space. Yeah. No, I was. A, we had talked about that. Okay, so I told. Well, you. and part of your show itself was, I would say, the whole a big component of the show is ritual. Uh, for those that weren't here, there was a, a one of the rooms dedicated to an altar.